Hello everybody, welcome to Fruitful Trees. Here I am in front of my mamay tree and I love mamay fruit. And you see a little bunch of little fruits growing and there's bigger fruits growing up there. It's just amazing. Well, I was at Trek recently, which is the Tropical Fruit Research Center by the University of Florida all the way in Homestead. And they're amazing. They have all these amazing fruit trees and I learn all about different types of fruits and how they grow and so on. And I was there recently and speaking to Jonathan Crane who's uh, the person that works there on all these fruit trees research and everything else. And we went to the area where they grow my maize and I was asking him all about my maize and how to grow the tree and what kind of varieties and all that. So today on the show, we're gonna have him there. His contact information is below the video. Uh, you can order my maize fruit if you want some. I'll put a link below the video to Laura Farms as well. So here is Jonathan Crane at Trek, the Tropical Research Center for for all tropical fruit here in Homestead, Florida. So great information in this video, check it out. You know, Mame right now, we've been harvesting, actually it's a, a little bit early, but we've been harvesting the Maganias. Um, and then we'll go into um, harvesting the, the Pantines or the Key Wests. Uh, but again, we have about 13, 14 varieties of Mame and, and they do come in throughout the year. Um, however, the quality varies quite a bit and really that's why Pantene and, and uh, Magania are the two most popular uh, because of the quality of the fruit. And now, uh, on my may trees, can you keep, can you trim those and keep those pruned, or do you have to let them grow tall? Yeah, we have some down here if you want to look at. Yeah, them. we'd love to look at those. Sure. Thank you. This is uh, part of our Mame Sapote collection. It was started in 1975. Uh, Carl Campbell started it, and we have been adding to it and changing it since that time. Um, we're standing now in front of some Magania trees. And, which we have been harvesting. Some of the larger fruit has been ready, um, not all of it. Um, and you'll notice it has, the Magania trees have this light green color. They just recently dropped their leaves and are initiating all this new leaf growth, which happens periodically. Um, so they drop the tree, their leaves every year. Um, interesting. So these are, you know, a, a, a tropical tree and they'll drop their leaves uh, in response to a cold event like we had this winter, um, but also drought in their native habitat. Drought will sometimes force that to happen. And then we're not sure, there may be actually a hormonal, internal hormonal cycle as well. But certainly drought and cold can throw them into this cycle of dropping their leaves and putting it out a new flush. It's interesting, all the magonias, these light green, are all behaving the same way right now. Um, now how often do you have to water the man, uh, the mame trees? Okay, so our, our irrigation regime depends on the weather. So during dry periods of more than about five days, we'll probably irrigate twice a week um, and put about half an inch of water each time, sometimes a little more. Once we get into the rainy season, we may not have to irrigate as often. So it, it varies throughout the year. Um, here you have in contrast, you see the dark colored, darker colored leaves of some of yeah. these other varieties. This is the Laura uh, variety. Um, oh yeah, look, the, the leaves are light on there. That's the Madonna. And here the trees are, the leaves are darker. Laura this is variety. Kopan, which Kopan. is another variety. And so we have, a, we have a, a, like I said, you know, probably about 14 different varieties of Mame. And they all have, you know, different fruit, come in at slightly different times. Um, the size and the shape and the quality of the fruit vary. Um, and you'll notice we do prune these trees and we know that we're sacrificing some of the fruit, especially up in the top of the tree. But again, it's really important that we keep the tree at a height that it's less likely to be pushed over or fall over during a tropical storm event. And that's our key thing. So I would rather have the canopy on the side and the production on the side and not worry about the fruit on the top and have the trees stay here. And it's easier for me to harvest, to spray and all the other would, things. Would, than does it, it depend on the variety or would the mame tree in general be considered a, like uh, in size growth wise to a vigorous mango tree or can it be, or do they have varieties that, I know there's a, a pumpkin one now that's uh, they say it's wolf. Is that right? I'm not yeah. aware of that. Okay. Um, I'd say more like a mango tree that in general, at least uh, historically, we've thought of them as, as 
potentially to get very large. Um, and you know, some people don't prune their mamay tree and they're 30, 40 feet tall. Very difficult to harvest, very difficult to care for. They lose the fruit production that's down here. Um, and, and some people, you know, they don't realize they should prune them or they, they're afraid to lose the fruit up in the top. But and you fruit, prune them right after you pick the fruit, similar, right after? Uh, well, that's, that's a very good thing. So when do you, when do you prune these? That's a harder decision because remember, the mamay has can have three I crops on That's the same right. tree. It can stay there for eighteen yeah. months. Yeah, eighteen, twenty-four months. So you can have, you know, the fruit you're gonna harvest in two years, one year, and the fruit you're gonna harvest. So especially in this collection, since they're all different varieties, you just sort of have to say, you know what? I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna prune this. I know I'm gonna lose some fruit fruit. Commercially, um, Again, I would rec uh, we recommend topping the trees, limiting the height of the tree, um, and then once the sides get to be too big, you really need to either hand prune them or come in with a machine and prune them. You're going to lose some fruit. But again, if you don't, you're going to lose the canopy at the bottom, and you're also going to end up um, with the potential that they fall so over. How high do you keep them, and how in do you keep them, or do you like to? Yeah. So. This is probably a good example right here. So this tree is probably 13, 14 feet. And that's generally what I want to keep them at. And you can see the canopy comes out probably six, eight feet from the trunk. And that leaves us just enough room for us to move equipment through. Um, so this seems to be pretty ideal. If I was planting this in my yard, um, you want to plant it at least 25 feet away from any buildings, structures, telephone wires, things like that. Why? Because it can get to be a very big tree. And if you're not going to prune it, especially it's got to be away from things because it could fall into a building, fall into the telephone wires. So if you're not going to prune it, you need to really put it out in the middle of nowhere. If you're going to prune it, you could put it, you know, 25 feet away from a structure, but you do need to take the tops out of it, at least occasionally to keep that height down to reduce the chances that it's going to fall over. Okay. And how 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 short can you realistically get away from it? Like, can you leave one that short? Or I know this is a newer a planting, but if you wanted to, can you leave one this size? I see fruit on there. If you prune yeah. all the time, or eventually will it get out to not not? That's a very good question. I can't tell you that I know. Okay. That. I can't tell you I know that. Because that's like the perfect size for a private uh, it is. small garden. It is. Uh, and I okay. guess different varieties will do different things. Exactly. Um, so this is a good example. So this is a good example of this one, yeah. yeah. So this is a good example of a tree that has shaded out the lower canopy. So you can see the first fruit potentially doesn't start for about seven feet. And I'm about six feet tall. So unfortunately, this tree had not been pruned uh, rigorously enough in the past. and it, Or it could be partly the genetics of this particular one um, has lost this lower canopy. And so there's really nothing I can do about this. The only thing that I could do is do something that's called rejuvenation, which would be to cut this tree uh, down to about four or five feet and then let the new shoots grow out and start the canopy over. Um, however, you, you have to whitewash everything with white paint uh, mixed with water, um, like a suntan lotion. Uh, to avoid overheating it, and you'd have to cut it back, and it would probably not produce fruit for six to eight years. Okay. Um, one of the, the things about this is that when they're drastically pruned or damaged, like from a hurricane, like they came in and lobbed off all these big shoots, uh, big limbs, the regrowth behaves much like a juvenile tree, and will may not flower for six eight years. Are you are you just as good at getting a tree and getting a new tree? <laughs> Uh, it depends, you know, whether you have a uh, sentimental value or sure. variety. But I'm in terms of age-wise. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you know, normally, you know, uh, a tree will start some fruit production in, you know, 
somewhere time. between four or five years. So it's sort of a crapshoot. Now, but some people might actually prefer this. If I had, if I only wanted one shade tree in my yard, it's great that I'm rolling in, right? This would be a wonderful yeah. little shade oh, situation. Yeah. So it depends on what people are looking for, right? And you know, that's a very good point. Some people do want fruit trees, but they want them for a multi-purpose, not just fruit. They want to put a hammock under here or a table or chairs or just to relax under the tree. So if they want it for shade, that's fine. You know, just know that, you know, your first fruit is going to be up a ways and, and you got to be very careful climbing ladders and things like that. Right? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So of all the tropical trees, would you say, I mean, I know all trees grow big, but mangoes are one of the more vigorous ones. Mangoes are very big. I'm can, having a uh, mamey. Well, mamey can get really tall in its native habitat. You're talking about 40, 60 feet. Uh, now, of course, our soils tend to limit the height, but certainly 35, 40 feet is potential. Is there a way to limit the height by uh, depending what you're using in, in terms of fertilizer and stuff? Well, of course, you know, if you're fertilizing a tree, whether it's organically or inorganic or conventionally, um, you're offering it nutrients and that's going to enhance its growth. If you don't fertilize it at all, you may limit the tree's growth, but you're probably limiting the fruit production and the fruit quality. Um, so it's you know, sort of a catch-20. And this important tip, you can confirm this for people that are new to planting. If I'm going to put fertilizer or food scraps or anything down for nutrients in the tree, a tree this size, you want to put them where the, the roots probably go as far out as the branches. So you'd be wasting your time putting it near the tree bark. You want to put them out towards the end of the tree. Is that true or not? That's well, what I've heard. Okay, so actually this root system actually probably extends well beyond even its neighbor. It probably goes out 25 feet. Is that on uh, this particular tree? Or big, big trees. trees. Big trees. Big, big trees, like big avocados, big mangoes. Okay. The root system radiates out probably... Even beyond the, okay. Oh, much beyond the drip line. Okay. However, what you're referring to is that the reason people talk about fertilizing from the drip line in, in this area is that because of the rainfall and it drips down here, there's a lot more water access to water here than under uh, and that so you have higher fibrous root proliferation and so that's where you want to put the fertilizer where the roots the fibrous roots are to take it up so it's not a yeah i mean it's just um the roots do go all the way out but certainly fertilizing in this area now I if you put them under the tree directly to fertilize it is that a waste of time or no, not really? no you can put it I, i'd say you know i would probably keep it uh, a couple of feet away from the trunk and but certainly out to the drip line in and if you're doing this at home it'd be like you know feeding chickens right you don't want to just clump it and throw these clumps you want to spread it so that it, it, it now some people it. say you don't want to put uh like cow manure right near the bark okay. you want a little away why would that good, good point about the cow manure if you're going to use cow manure in general you want it to be well composted so fresh cow manure, I would not recommend. Why? Because the fresh cow manure has a high content of urea. And urea can be so concentrated that it actually burns and damages the fibrous root system. And sometimes you'll see the tree react like a toxic effect. So if it's well composted cow manure, you can distribute it, you know, wherever you want. Right against the tree, it doesn't matter. I wouldn't put it up against the tree, but certainly, you know, a couple Why of Why wouldn't away. you put it against the tree? Uh, because when you put... Uh, whether it's fertilizer or mulch, right up against the tree, you're keeping that bark moist. And when that's moist for too long, fungi can begin to colonize the trunk and places like that and cause rot problems. Okay. Yeah. Now, okay, so what about uh, human manure? You don't know much about that, do you? Uh, well, other than that, uh, I wouldn't use human manure. Um, there's all kinds of food safety issues with that. I don't know if you're familiar with the food safety modernization. I'm act. not talking about for commercial growing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Human waste. You know, there's a lot of pathogens in human waste. Again, if somebody was going to use that, um, you know, it's probably be composted, um, well composted. Um, you know, the, the sewage sludge that people sell, yeah. you know, that's usually composted twice, once aerobically and once anaerobically to kill the pathogens. And then it's safe to use. Um, so I understand uh, about a garden, but if you're going to put human manure right here, I mean, even if there's pathogens, how's that going to... Yeah, 
I mean, it's just the other thing too, is that, you know, if people come into contact with it or your pets come into contact with it and then you come into contact with your pets, you could potentially end up getting sick. Okay, okay. And now tell us about the root system uh, and the drain field. Like, so you wouldn't want to plant a mommy tree on top of a drain <laughs> field, right? Probably not a good idea. You don't want to plant trees on uh, next to or on top of a drain field. Why? Because the root system can proliferate in there and it stops up the drain field ruining the purpose of the drain field. That's basically the major. Well, so now this tree here, and I had a big shade tree in my yard. You're saying the roots are going to go out 20, 30 feet. So wherever you plant in your yard, the roots are going to eventually hit the drain field. They could, they could, um, you know, but you know, this tree, what was planted in 1975. So you're talking about a long time uh, before the roots get way out here, right? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, you want to be away from, that's another good point, be away from drain fields, <laughs> structures, telephone poles, telephone wires. When you plant some of these tr trees that can get very big, why? Because they can interfere with things, they can fall on the structure, fall on the telephone wire. Now if you keep this tree short uh, and it's near a drain field, does that keep the root system shorter as well and not well, necessarily? Yeah, so you know that trees like to have a balance between their roots and their shoots. So the deal is, is that if you're pruning the tree and you have a big root system, it just keeps growing vegetatively and may not, may not flower and fruit very well. So, um, I mean, you could keep it small, but you may not get much fruit. Yeah. Okay. So it's sort of a, a balance. I would put the vigorous trees away from things, things like sugar apple, um, you can Carambola, you can plant them closer to things because they don't get as big or they're easier to keep small. Guava trees, I mean, you see commercially people keep trees at six, seven feet. Carambola, I've seen those trees get bigger than any. They get huge. Yeah. However, they are pretty easy to keep somewhere below 12, yeah. 10 feet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, even though it can get to be a very big tree, All but right. it's easier. All right. And the avocados, though, they get pretty big. They roots. can get huge. Okay. Well. All right. All right, everybody, there he was. That was Jonathan Crane at Trek. Uh, his contact information is below. Remember, if you want to order and taste some of May fruit, if you never had it, uh, you can get some great varieties right now and pretty much all the time because uh, Laura Farms has amazing trees. I'll put his link below the video. Uh, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe, subscribe to this channel. And uh, hopefully I'll have a lot of success growing these May fruits that are that are on my tree. All right, everybody, have a great day and keep growing.